Saul's victory over the Ammonites. In our last story, Saul was anointed as the first king of Israel. He was a strong, handsome, and well-built man who stood a foot taller than every other man in Israel. The people rejoiced over finally having a king, yet Samuel had warned them that having a king would not be exactly what they envisioned. Now we see Saul's first victory as king. He slays the evil Ammonite army with force, and the entirety of Israel is restored to balance and prosperity, as inspired by the book of 1 Samuel. Hello, Pastor Jack Graham here with today's episode of the Bible in a Year podcast. Yesterday, we met the first king of Israel. We heard how God showed Samuel the man that he had chosen for the job, Saul. Saul was not expecting to be king and was very surprised, even confused by what Samuel was telling him. But God filled Saul with peace and confidence and faith, and when he was presented to the people, he was ready for the challenge. The people received Saul with great joy, but they were warned that having a king would not be all they had dreamed it would be. Still for now, Saul was God's man for the job, and he began from a place of humility and a desire to serve God and his people. Today, we will hear of Saul's first battle as king. God will give him a huge victory over the Ammonites, and Israel will enter into a time of prosperity. So let's listen now to today's reading. Jabesh Gilead was a small and quiet city on the edge of Israel. Farmers, shepherds, and their families dwelt peacefully in the land, minding their own business and working diligently. Children played in the fields as their fathers and mothers worked. All was well in the tranquil city of Jabesh Gilead, until one day battle horns could be heard in the distance. The farmers looked up towards the horizon as a sea of Ammonites peaked above the hills. The women took their children into their homes, and the men of the city grabbed anything they could to brace themselves. The Ammonites swarmed the city like locusts. The Ammonites surrounded the city on horseback. Their scowls loomed over the men of Jabesh. They were completely surrounded with no means of escape, nor could they fight, for there were too many. The elder of Jabesh stepped forward and shouted, Please do not harm us! He bowed to the floor. We will do anything you ask. Make a treaty with us. We will serve you. But please, do not kill us. The men began to laugh. (laughs) Their dark and deep cackles filled the air like a poisonous gas. From among the crowd of Ammonites approached Nahash, their leader. He was larger than the rest of his men. His face was dark and battle-hardened, and his eyes revealed a corrupt wit. He was a truly frightening man and worthy of fear. He dismounted his horse and slowly approached the men. He looked down at their elder, bowing, and smiled. He leaned down and said, Of course we will make a treaty with you. Why waste my men's time and energy? Nahash took the man by his arm and propped him up. He dusted him off and smiled. If you gouge out all your right eyes, we will spare you. You will serve us and Israel will be disgraced. Nahash then patted the leader on the back and began walking back to his horse. The elder of Jabesh begged Nahash, saying, Give us seven days. If there is no hero to challenge you, then we shall be your slaves. Nahash smiled, knowing full well no hero could defeat him in battle. He agreed and allowed the men to return to their work. Yet the Ammonites stayed and harassed the city. Their presence was like chains wrapped around their necks. Messengers were sent out throughout all of Israel, and the people wept in fear. In the distance, Saul was tilling his field behind oxen. The hot sun beat down on him. Saul's strong body was dripping with sweat as he methodically broke up the ground beneath him for planting. Saul could hear a faint cry from the city. Some people were running across the roads and fleeing. Saul grabbed a man passing by and said, "'What is happening with the people?' Why can I hear cries from the city? The man told him of Nahash's insurgents on Jabesh. Saul stood still and let the man go. He stood still in the fields quietly. Saul had experienced anger before, but this fire in his belly was different. The protective spirit of God came upon Saul. His eyes were like flames. His arms and legs tensed up like a mother bear whose cubs were under attack. 
This was the first time Saul truly felt like a king. Saul looked back to his oxen and tore them in pieces with his sword. He took those pieces and sent them all throughout Israel with messengers, saying, Whoever does not fight with Saul and Samuel for the heart of Israel will be torn apart like these oxen. The message had its desired effect. Three hundred and thirty thousand men gathered together with their swords and spears. Saul marched in front of them. They marched as one man, one body. Saul sent messengers ahead to Jabesh Gilead, saying, Tomorrow, when the sun is high and hot, you shall have your salvation. The next day Saul stood above the plains where the Ammonites met for battle. The sun was hot, and Saul tilted his head towards the sun and closed his eyes. The men were hungry for battle. They felt braver with a king in front of them. Saul lifted his sword towards the battlefield, and the Israelites yelled as they descended upon the Ammonites. Saul split his army into three companies, and the three armies surrounded the Ammonites and crashed upon them. The Israelites were overpowering. Swords clanged together as the men of Israel fought with ferocity and speed. Saul was among them, fighting his way to the center. He stood a head high above every enemy. He swung his sword with power and authority, striking down every man in his path. Nahash was in sight and the two ran towards one another. Their swords and fists clashed. The two kings exchanged blows and parried one another's advances. Nahash swung upward towards Saul, leaving his side exposed, and Saul drove his sword through his ribs. The Ammonites scattered as Israel chased after them. Victory had been won, and God had gone before them. The people cheered and said to Samuel, Who were the men that doubted Saul? Bring them to us, and we shall put them to death. Saul stopped them, saying, No more Israelites shall die today, for God has given us his salvation. So Samuel led the nation up to Gilgal, where they renewed their oath to God and to Saul. They made a sacrifice to the Lord, and the entire nation celebrated and rejoiced over the new era brought by Saul. Saul was elated and stayed humble, Yet something inside him enjoyed the praise and worship of his people. A subtle pride began to seep through cracks of his heart. None of the Israelites or Saul could see it, but God saw it and watched Saul closely. We begin today's reading in the small town of Jabesh Gilead. It's not a mighty city or even an important one, but it is Israel's territory, and the Ammonites set their sights on it as an easy target. They surrounded the city and are ready to attack. Terrified, the elders of this city approach the Ammonite army and offer a surrender. They want their lives spared and will willingly give up their freedom to save themselves. The Ammonites say they'll accept the treaty, but they must all gouge out their right eye. The only purpose for this condition, of course, was humiliation and the torture of God's people. So the elders aren't ready to accept these terms and they asked that they think it over and send out a call for help. The fact that the Ammonites agreed to wait signals just how arrogant they must have been. They had the city surrounded and could have easily taken it then and there. Why wait for a larger army to arrive? They did not fear or respect Israel, and they certainly did not fear or respect God. When the word got to Saul, he burned with righteous anger. He was angry that foreigners would act with such cruelty and make a mockery of his people, and that, of course, was totally unacceptable. The Spirit of God filled Saul. He slaughtered his oxen and sent pieces of the beast as a message to his people. Anyone who did not join him in battle to protect Israel would meet the same fate as the oxen. His message, though startling, was effective, and 330,000 men gathered for battle. Israel was united to protect that one small town, and they were led by a man who was filled with the Spirit of God. The Ammonites never stood a chance. Saul led his men in a commanding victory, killing all but a few Ammonites who scattered and ran away in fear. If there was ever any doubt that Saul was fit to be the king, it was a race that day. Some had doubted him, and the people knew this. So in 1 Samuel 11, 12 to 13, here is what we read. 
Then the people said to Samuel, Who is it that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has worked salvation for Israel. No, this was not a time for revenge or killing, especially not the killing of God's own people. So Saul unified the people under one banner, that God had brought salvation to his people. Rather than look at this as his own personal victory, he turned the attention of the people of God to the Savior of Israel, God himself. They rejoiced because of what God had done. When we succeed, we can sometimes be tempted to take credit or feel pride in our own accomplishments. There's nothing wrong, of course, with celebrating, but we must always give glory to God who gives us the victory. We win not in our own strength or cleverness or charms. It is God at work in us and through us. And in this first victory, that's exactly what Saul did. But unfortunately, soon he would start to believe his own greatness and pride would creep into his life. It would be the beginning of the end and his downfall. We'll hear more about that the next time. Dear Lord, we thank you for victory, victory that we know comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is not because of what we have done, but because of what you have done, Lord. Not because we are strong, but because you are our mighty God. We thank you for your spirit who lives in us and empowers us and enables us to live lives to accomplish your purposes. May we always be humble before you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to today's Bible in a Year podcast. I'm Pastor Jack Graham from Dallas, Texas. Download the Pray.com app and make Bible study and prayer a priority in your life. If you enjoyed this podcast, Please share it with someone you know because it can make a genuine, even eternal difference in their lives. And if you want more resources on how you can know the power of God through Jesus Christ, then visit jackgraham.org.